gamers. Man, I had a whole bit lined up about the Halo TV show, but then Will Smith was all like, Falcon Punch! And then gamers were all like, Damn, man, Chris Rock's gonna have to do his shows behind a perspex screen now like the Pope to protect him from all the people trying to go viral with their own Will Smith moments. I wonder if Jeff Keighley's watching this right now thinking, man, how am I gonna top that? Don't even try, Jeff. Joseph Farris is more than enough excitement for the most of us. Ladies and gentlemen, while the slap heard around the world rings out, the world of video game marches on, albeit a slower march, as release season is over and we begin our slide into this multi-month malaise. Damn, that was some good alliteration. English majors, can I get a like please? Thank you very much. From Halo's TV debut to GTA subscription services, a lot has gone down this week. So let's not waste any time. Here comes the news. To Battlefield news, and if recent reporting is accurate, it seems as though EA Dice and EA's head honchos are finally ready to listen to the community. Funny how that only happens after they've shipped the game and taken our money. Dice Insider Tom Henderson is reporting that when it comes to the next Battlefield game, one source told him, quote, I think we'll be reverting a lot of the changes we made in Battlefield 2042, end quote. He went on to report that, quote, one former developer who recently left Dice following the launch of Battlefield 2042 had suggested that the next game was almost going to be like a hero shooter, with specialists becoming mercenaries. It does seem like this plan may have changed though, with recent playtest and feedback sessions focusing on the class system in Battlefield 2042, end quote. Henderson would go on to report that his sources have confirmed the next Battlefield game will have a modern day or near future setting. Battlefield 2042's updates will continue as DICE are essentially obligated to ship the four specialist passes that they sold when they sold the upgraded editions of the game earlier, but yeah, after that, who knows? I certainly wouldn't bet on EA DICE sticking with 2042 for the long term, as this whole affair is surely a chapter that everyone, the Battlefield community included want to put behind them. Again, it's frustrating that this sort of introspection didn't happen prior to launch when during the beta everyone was telling EA DICE that the game was broken and the design choices were terrible. EA knew what they were about to sell us and they sold it to us anyway and that is sadly how it goes for far too many modern video games. A reminder to never pre-order and always check reviews. Speaking of disappointing launches, Gran Turismo 7's apology tour continues. After launching with a frustrating always online requirement that's seen people unable to play the the game for up to 30 hours and a slew of shitty microtransactions baked into the core gameplay experience, Gran Turismo's director put out a statement trying to quell the angry mob. It didn't work, and so now he's trying again with another statement. This new one directly apologizes to the community for the outages and to the nerfs made to the currency gains for certain events. It goes on to describe a slew of changes coming to the game like increased currency rewards and the ability to sell cars. Reading through this was really interesting because I haven't played GT7 yet and to see the scale of changes that they're implementing really illuminated just how bad this stuff was. Like imagine a blanket increase of 100% more credits for a whole bunch of races. The credit cap used to be 20 million credits for non-paid credits, which implies to me that you could exceed that cap if you paid money. And some cars can cost up to 15 million credits. They're upping that cap to 100 million now, but my god, that cap is like shameful. I'm glad the GT community are getting these changes, but it would have been much nicer had their game shipped without all this bullshit. While we're on the topic of Sony, let's talk about Project Spartacus, because apparently the news dam is about to break on that one. Spartacus is the worst kept secret in the games industry. It's Sony's response to Xbox Game Pass, a subscription service offering a range of back catalog titles with a few different tiers with different access levels and perks. This was initially revealed by Jason Schrei of Bloomberg, and now he's back saying that the service will be revealed as soon as this week. I mean, between now and when this video goes live, it may have already been announced, which would be standard, since it seems video game executives love to time their biggest news for the window between when this show is written and when it gets published. Looking at you, Phil. So yeah, if Schreier is correct, then keep your eyes peeled, but we'll certainly circle back to that one next week. A successful subscription service is an extremely important objective for Sony, but for more reasons than you might first assume. Obviously, the recurring revenue is nice, as is the competitive advantage of being able to offer a service like this on your platform. But recent figures from Microsoft presented at GDC paint a broader picture of why this matters so much. Commentator Benji Sales shared these Microsoft-created slides on Twitter and summarize some of their key findings, including the fact that Game Pass games see an average of eight times more players 
with 3.5 times more players for bigger games and 15 times more players for indies. Turns out people who are sub to Game Pass also spend more on games, on DLC and on in-game items like boosters. Finally, Game Pass has become a huge boost to the growth of the indie scene, with over two-thirds of indie growth revenue since 2016 being attributable to Game Pass. These are all impressive figures that showcase just how much Game Pass is transforming the landscape, and with numbers like this, I suspect Spartacus won't be the only Game Pass competitor we see popping up over the next few years. Back in the day, a gaming subscription service typically meant World of Warcraft, and while the game-specific subscription has remained largely specific to the MMO genre, there have been some breakout efforts. Like the time Fallout 76 charged people $180 a year to make their absolute shit heap of a game slightly less insufferable. They still have that subscription, by the way. Go check it out. Anyway, as though inspired by this, Rockstar this week announced a subscription service for their nine-year-old game that gives you basically nothing and you can only subscribe to it if you repurchase the game on next-gen consoles. Never ceases to amaze me just how low Rockstar and Take-Two will go, but here's the deal. It's called GTA Plus because apparently it's legal to launch any subscription service and not give it a plus suffix. It costs $6 a month. It gives you $500,000 worth of in-game currency every month, which is basically nothing in the GTA economy. It gives you some free cars and free upgrades and the property and some other bullshit. Basically just random in-game stuff and you're paying six bucks a month for it. Weirdest thing of all is that to get this, you have to be playing the next-gen console versions of the game. That's like the scummiest part because there are probably plenty of GTA fans on PC or last-gen consoles who do want to pay for this for some reason, but they can't because Rockstar wants them to buy the game again on a next-gen console. There's no reason whatsoever for them to structure it like this but they're doing it anyway. I wish I had more commentary on this subject, but it's just another example of Rockstar and Take-Two being Rockstar and Take-Two. All right, how about some good news? This week at Bungie, Vengeance. You might remember that last week, a number of Destiny 2 content creators were hit by copyright takedown strikes, which looked like they were coming from Bungie until Bungie themselves got copy struck. Bungie would clarify that they were not issuing these strikes, nor were any of their affiliated parties, leading everyone to suspect that it was just a scammer taking advantage of the loophole that lets pretty much anyone make fraudulent copyright claims on YouTube because YouTube's system is pathetic. Well, we all thought that Bungie would quietly sort this out, which they did, the strikes were removed, but none of us thought that Bungie would lawyer up and take this fight to the next level. Turns out that's exactly what they're doing. Bungie are suing the person who made these fraudulent copyright claims, and they're seeking up to $150,000 in damages for each claim. There were at least five claims, so that's a lot of money for the person responsible to have to pay out. Thing is, the identity of that person is not known, so part of this lawsuit is about getting Google to reveal the identity of that individual, if that's even possible. The subtext to all of this is that by forcing Google to have to try and track this person down, it will hopefully prompt them to close this fucking loophole that literally just lets people create fake email addresses and fake YouTube accounts and start making spurious copyright claims. No company that I can think of has framed this fight in quite this way, and if Bungie can achieve a win, that's gonna be a massive W for the entire content creation community, and we are all going to owe Bungie at least a little bit of silver. I'll keep you posted on this one as it unfolds. It's not just scammy outfits making bullshit copyright claims though, it's also Nintendo. This is a true story by the way, so get ready for this. This week, Nintendo issued a takedown notice for a scanned copy of a strategy guide for Super Mario 64 that was released back in 1996. This guide is not in print and it hasn't been in print for decades. It's a rare piece of video game history because it has all these hand-built dioramas that I can't even show you because Nintendo will likely copy strike my channel if I do so. There is absolutely no commercial reason why Nintendo would need to take down a scanned copy of a video game guidebook from 25 years ago that is no longer in print, but that is how Nintendo do. For real, I've actually lost a lot of affection for Nintendo over the past few years as I've looked more closely at how they treat their community, their creators, their customers, and anyone trying to preserve their history. It's a bummer because Nintendo still makes great games, but it's just impossible to support them as a company when they pull petty bullshit like this. Alright Guild Wars nerds, I know there was some big blog posting this week and I bet you didn't think I'd cover it here, right? Well, that's right, I had no intention to, but I don't run this show anymore. Austin's in charge now. So when he says we're doing a Guild Wars block, then we're doing a Guild Wars block. Take it away, Austin. All right, so last week, ArenaNet released a blog post titled The Future of Guild Wars 2. 
In this post, the studio leads spoke about the success of their recent expansion, as well as outlining future plans for the MMO. According to ArenaNet, the number of active players has more than doubled over the last three years, with End of Dragons outselling their previous expansion. While other MMOs may choose to remove old content, <coughs> Destiny, <coughs> ArenaNet are looking to strengthen the new player experience as they gear up for the Steam release planned for some time this year. Beginning April 19, they'll be releasing monthly updates to reintroduce their Season 1 content, which was removed from the game a long time ago for the sake of a quote-unquote evolving world, a mistake they've since learned from. Not only are they currently working on the next season of content updates, but the studio has also confirmed that a fourth expansion is coming, which is a big statement as historically they've left expansion announcements until long after development has commenced. All in all, ArenaNet's commitment to Guild Wars 2 has never been clearer and the future of this now 10-year-old MMO is looking brighter than ever. Which is great news because it means I get to keep making these cameos and hassling Shill up to one day review Guild Wars 2. Austin, can you imagine what would happen if I reviewed Guild Wars before I reviewed Final Fantasy XIV? Do you know what that comment section would look like? It would look like the comment section of a man who just put out a one hour long review of a Destiny 2 DLC. Those were some bad life choices that I made them. Besides, Austin already reviewed Guild Wars. It's up on his channel. To Witcher 4 news and the announcement of the new game last week did lead to a lengthy discussion about the legacy of both The Witcher 3 and the more recently released Cyberpunk 2077, with many people discussing the well-documented history of crunch that CD Projekt Red developers suffered under. It's a legacy that the studio is clearly trying to put behind them, as The Witcher 4's game director Jason Salma has said that there wouldn't be any crunch when developing the next game. He was responding to a Twitter user who said, quote, You forgot to mention the sign-on bonus of horrible crunch and being treated like a dog, end quote, to which Salma responded, quote, never on my watch, end quote. This sort of image correction is imperative for CD Projekt Red, who lost their luster with the implosion of Cyberpunk. I personally know developers who have been approached to work at CD Projekt Red, but refused to do so because they heard all the horror stories about the culture. So if CD Projekt Red are going to attract and retain development talent, then they're going to have to get their house in order. The very announcement of the next Witcher game is most likely explainable by this need to recruit talent, as is the move to Unreal Engine 5 since CD Projekt Red's Red Engine was apparently notoriously difficult to work with and didn't provide a lot of career mobility outside of CD Projekt Red. A few quick things to finish up, apparently Skate 4 is now in internal testing, which isn't huge news in and of itself, but it does show the title is making progress, which is nice. Amazon Games boss Mike Frazzini has stepped down from his position. This dude had absolutely zero experience in the world of video games, but was handpicked by Bezos to lead this division, leading to what was essentially an implosion between the failed launch of that Top Gear game that no one even heard about, the launch and then deletion of Hero Shooter Crucible, and the very wonky launch of New World. Lost Ark has been a huge success, but let's not kid ourselves, that was an established game that Amazon just published in the West, not exactly a breakthrough contribution. EA are about to press the button on their first FIFA-less game. They're giving up the FIFA rights since they say they're too expensive, and the series will henceforth be known as EA Sports FC. I do wonder what impact this will have on sales and whether or not another publisher will pick up the rights, since I know that Take-Two has certainly hinted at that in the past. And finally, Reggie thinks that Meta's Metaverse is bullshit. You love to see it. When speaking about Facebook's big push into the Metaverse, Reggie said, quote, In order to be innovative, you really need to be thinking about the consumer first. And I don't think they do. I think they think about advertising revenue first, end quote. Ooh, the rare Reggie burn. They don't come along often, but when they do, that shit is hot. So, what got announced or delayed this week? Well, I don't know about you guys, but I think the most hype announcement was this one. Keep your head up and your equipment charged. This is Ghostbusters Spirits Unleashed, and it's an asymmetric PvP shooter where you play as either a Ghostbuster or the Ghost, flying through walls and generally messing shit up. This game does feature the voice of some of the original cast members, and they seem to be grey-bearded mentors training up the next generation of Ghostbusters, and that's just fine with me. Though I would have preferred a game where I got to play as Bill Murray. We need more games where we play as Bill Murray. I want Lost in Translation from like... RGG Studios. You're going to tell me that's not a game of the year premise right there? Anyway, I digress. Ghostbusters Spirits Unleashed doesn't have a release date yet, but it's slated for a quarter four release this year, heading to PlayStation, Xbox, and the Epic Games Store. This next one looks really nice. It's called Lego Brick Tales, and it's from the makers of the recently released and much loved Lego Bridge Constructor. This one seems to be about, well, building Lego. The demonstration here shows a pretty one-to-one -one experience with what building Lego is like in real life. 
following instructions, numbered parts, etc. The difference is that the stuff you build in game actually flies and it seems like each new build is to solve some sort of problem presented in the little scenes that have been constructed. Lego is a really expensive hobby and if you make a game that can simulate the experience of building Lego without having to spend 300 bucks on a new set then I think that game has a good shot at taking off. I lied when I said the Ghostbusters game was the biggest announcement of the week because this week Bandai Namco revealed DLC for their recently released wildly successful genre-defining masterpiece of a video game which Austin why are you showing Elden Ring footage when I'm clearly talking about my friend Peppa Pig that's right gamers my friend Peppa Pig is getting DLC it's called Pirate Adventures Pedro Pony is having a birthday party it's pirate themed and shenanigans are sure to ensue as they always do with Pepper and her friends this one's already out now but you guys already knew that because you're probably already playing it you guys never miss the good stuff. There were two delay announcements this week. The first was a sort of delay for upcoming Steely Dan scored Contraband. We don't really know much about this one except that it's from Avalanche Studios, makers of Just Cause. It's exclusive to Xbox and PC and it'll come to Game Pass on day one. And it's sort of a smuggling game, which I'm down for as a concept since Smuggler's Run was a long time ago and that wasn't exactly the most fulfilling smuggling fantasy. This one was meant to be out this year, even though they never officially announced it as a release date, but apparently it has been pushed to next year. That's according to Rand Althor19 and Jez Corden, who spoke about it on their Xbox 2 podcast. They have a good track record when it comes to Xbox news, so while we can't lock this one in yet, there's at least a good chance it's true. The final delay announcement is a lot more official because it comes directly from the horse's mouth, or maybe the shark's mouth. Rocksteady's The Suicide Squad game has been officially delayed into 2023. The announcement came in a tweet from the game's creative director and studio co-founder Sefton Hill, who said, quote, We've made the difficult decision to delay Suicide Squad, kill the Justice League to spring 2023. I know a delay is frustrating, but that time is going into making the best game we can. I look forward to bringing the chaos to Metropolis together. Thanks for your patience, end quote. This isn't too much of a surprise since Jason Schreier of Bloomberg had earlier leaked this delay and this is just official confirmation. It does make sense since Warner Brothers are releasing another DC Universe co-op game this year in the form of Gotham Knights. So giving them both a little breathing room is a good move. Hopefully we get Suicide Squad in quarter one of 2023 because damn, I'm looking forward to this one. So what came out last week, AKA the review roundup? Well, kicking things off is Expedition Zero. This is an indie survival horror game with a focus on the survival since crafting and resource management seem to be fairly important in this one. Even though there are only a small number of reviews out at the moment, they seem pretty mid, literally. The game sits at only 44% mixed on Steam and critic reviews are hovering at around the five out of 10 mark. Game Watcher scored it a 5 out of 10 saying, quote, When Expedition Zero is at its best, it's a tense battle against the elements as you scavenge and try to get out of a surreal zone. At its worst, it's getting killed by annoying monsters. Unfortunately, you do more of the latter, making it more frustrating than scary. If Expedition Zero still interests you with its problems, get ready to grit your teeth, end quote. It's hard to believe that Nintendo still has time to release video games, what with how busy they are DMCAing everything, but they managed to squeeze at least one out this week, Kirby and the Forgotten Land. And it's a reminder of how Nintendo manages to get away with being so scummy. They still make good video games. Kirby sits at an extremely impressive 85 on Open Critic. IGN loved it, scoring it an 8 out of 10 and saying, quote, Kirby and the Forgotten Land successfully warps the series' classic mix of ability-based combat, platforming, and secret hunting into the third dimension, end quote, while GameSpot loved it even more, scoring it a 9 out of 10 and saying, quote, Kirby and the Forgotten Land is the biggest, most inventive entry in the long-running franchise, end quote. There is commentary that the game is extremely easy, but that's sort of fine since this is ultimately a kid's game, basically, so if you're looking for a more adult or challenging 3D platformer, then this one likely isn't for you. Finally, Tiny Tina's Wonderlands arrived last week on all platforms but the Switch. This is one that I played and reviewed, link below the like button, and I'm pleased to tell you that it's good. It's not amazing, but it's pretty damn good. It's a straightforward looty shooty game that is, in my view, better than Borderlands 3, and I actually like Borderlands 3. It's a Dungeons and Dragon themed adventure where Tiny Tina is the DM, and because she's batshit insane, so too are the characters, locations, and events that she's cooked up for you. It's still very Borderlands in gameplay and tone, but it remixes enough of the elements to feel fresh. I wasn't the only one who liked it. The game sits at a strong 79 on Open Critic. Game Informer scored it a 9.5, which I think is a little on the high side, but nonetheless, they said, quote, 
Wonderlands is upbeat and fun from start to finish, offering a rewarding adventure filled with goofy characters, imaginative bosses, and a great sense of ownership over your character through it all, end quote. While PC Gamer were a lot more cool on it, scoring it a 70 and saying, quote, better than Borderlands 3, but not quite reaching the heights of Borderlands 2 at its best, end quote. So what's coming out this week? Well, we are settling into that multi-month dry spell I mentioned last week, and this week's slate of releases is kind of proof positive of that. Arriving today, we've got a next-gen update for Crusader Kings 3, it was one of the most critically acclaimed strategy releases of the last few years and now you'll be able to play it on both PS5 and the Xbox Series consoles and even better, it's coming to Game Pass, so knock yourself out. Another update-ish thing is the director's cut version of Death Stranding, which to this point has been a PS5 exclusive but now arrives for PC. You can purchase this outright but there's also a $10 upgrade path if you already own the base game. Director's Cut isn't really a director's cut, per se, since Kojima owns the studio, so who's gonna cut anything from the game he makes? Huh? Nobody, that's right. It's more of a director's update, adding new weapons, gadgets, and missions to expand the journey without fundamentally altering all of the weird, frustrating eccentricities that made this game such a goddamn masterpiece. That's right, I said it again, and I'm gonna keep saying it, all right? Final release of the week is Weird West, a game I've been very excited to get my hands on. I can confirm that I'm playing this one right now ahead of a review later this week, so I can't offer any impressions since I am under embargo, but I can tell you that this is the first game from Wolf Eye Studios comprised of many arcane vets and led by Raphael Colantonio, director of the Dishonored and Prey franchises. This is an immersive sim, but it's set in the Wild West and it's especially wild since half the people you meet turn out to be werewolves or zombies or all sorts of weird shit, hence the name Weird West. This one is arriving on the 31st, it's hitting PlayStation, PC and Xbox where it will be a day one Game Pass title. Review will be up on the embargo, not allowed to say when yet, so if you'd like to know when that goes live then just hit the subscribe button, ding the notification bell and I'll take care of the rest. Put this on your radar. You guys might not remember BPM, that game was basically Doom the Musical, combining demonic first person shooter action with rhythm based gameplay where you could only shoot, reload or dodge on the beat. It was sick, I loved it, but it was also pretty flawed, for example, it looked terrible. Gun Jam seems to be picking up where BPM left off, taking the same concept, adding a more EDM soundtrack and then making the whole thing look really pretty. Visually this thing looks nice, big expansive environments bursting with colour, a welcome change from that weird red tint that BPM was rocking. The soundtrack being different is also nice since I know that there's at least one other rhythm based first person shooter in the works that's rocking a metal soundtrack. I'm liking the little touches here like the little hand movement that kind of looks like the characters clicking along with the beat. I don't know, I just love this weird little subgenre of games and I'm always keen to check out new arrivals in this space. This one comes from Jaw Drop Games, it's being published by Raw Fury. It's exclusive to PC for now and it's listed as coming soon, but that doesn't mean much. Hopefully it's sometime this year. If you're interested, be sure to wishlist the title on Steam as this always helps developers out in a big way. Sort of free stuff time and we are just on the cusp of all the big announcements for PS Plus and Games with Gold and Game Pass and Twitch Prime games. They didn't make this episode but they'll surely be announced in the next one to two days so keep an eye out for them but rest assured I will cover it off next week. In the meantime this is your last chance to grab all those sort of free games before they disappear so if you haven't yet added them to your libraries then get on that. Epic are serving up their weekly offering as per usual. Right now it's Demon's Tilt, a cult pinball action but come the first Epic are giving away two games. The first is City of Brass, a first-person adventure game from 2018 that's basically like M-rated Aladdin, which is really just Prince of Persia when you think about it. The other free game for the week is Creative Assembly's Total War Warhammer. It's the first entry in the strategy trilogy, so if you've been eyeing it off but didn't want to front the cash, then this is for you. Two quick things from Game Pass I want to shout out this week. The first is that they're currently giving away a three-month trial of Marvel Unlimited as part of the Game Pass perks. Marvel Unlimited is the digital comic subscription service that plays host to over 29,000 Marvel comics. Not a bad deal if you're looking to make the jump from movies to print. If you'd like to make the jump from game to TV, then this one's for you. Xbox Game Pass is also offering a 30-day trial of Paramount+. Plus. So if you wait until all of the episodes of Halo are out and then you activate this free trial, then you can binge watch the entire thing and not pay a cent. 
Well, except for the Game Pass cost, which is already a steal, so can't complain too much. Our feel-good story for the week does come with a trigger warning for any siblings who are forced to use the shit controller growing up. You know, the Mad Cats one that had all those weird designs on it and six extra buttons that didn't do anything, and those auto-fire switches. Man, who used those? Nobody. Anyway, very soon the next Sonic movie will be releasing. It's a big deal because the first Sonic movie low-key ruled, but this one is gonna be even better, probably, for one reason and one reason only. Knuckles is in it, and Knuckles is being played by Idris Elba. To celebrate the upcoming movie, Xbox thought it would be cool to make a special limited release controller. Not the first time they've done something like this, mind you. Recently, they had controllers for the LeBron James Space Jam movie, and outside of the world of movies, Xbox recently did a lineup of controllers based on nail polish colors. Alright, fair enough. So, back to Sonic. We hear that they're doing some special Sonic controller, so what do we imagine? You know. A blue controller, maybe a red one, some special decals, maybe the buttons could be gold rings. That'd be cool, right? I'd buy that. Tell you what I'm not gonna buy. These fucking things! Yes, these are real products that Microsoft are making. Furry controllers. Though notably, Microsoft are explicitly avoiding the word furry and instead calling them bristly controllers. Not the right word. This isn't a pine needle. This is a furry controller. Look at it. It's furry. I could wash my car with this thing. If you are very lucky, or unlucky, you can win a set of these things by retweeting something on the Xbox Twitter account. They are not being made available for sale, which is unequivocally a good thing, because if they were, we'd all be receiving them as gifts from people that hate us. And that, ladies and gentlemen, was the week in video games. I hope you enjoyed yourself, and if you did, then slap that like button like you just made a joke about your wife. Ayo! If you'd like to come back next week, then please do so by hitting the subscribe button, ding the notification bell. This week is a Weird West review, and then, I don't know, I'm thinking maybe a Steam Deck review next week. Maybe circle back to Ghostwire Tokyo, since I'm pretty keen to check that one out. The upcoming drought gives me plenty of flex to play and review what I want. So, who knows what the next few months hold. I hope you join me for the ride. Thanks for stopping by this week. I'll see you again real soon.